awful lot of people who are white uh, are visible in those demonstrations. People want change. People have a sense that the system is unfair, that elections are rigged. Uh, they know the gerrymandering done in the state legislature and in the congressional delegation is producing really wacko results. Uh, when you have roughly even voting between Democrats and Republicans in the congressional races and you get 10 Republicans and three Democrats out of it, it doesn't take a genius to figure out somebody has got their thumb on the scale and is tilting the results. So I think that uh, clearly people who have power don't want to give it up. They fight to hang on to it. They keep coming back one way or another uh, with new proposals, new maneuvers. But it, time is going to run out. This is a particularly dramatic moment for North Carolina. Have a case coming up before the US Supreme Court on gerrymandering. You've got a set of cases going through the state courts on gerrymandering. Uh, you have two bills in the legislature talking about gerrymandering reform, including one uh, sponsored by Republicans as well as Democrats. I, all that is telling you change is coming. And I think what's happening is that at least some of those who have power and have been reluctant and fighting not to give it up, recognize that the demographics and the dynamics of politics in North Carolina are changing, and they want to get on board and maybe control the rate of change instead of resisting change totally. So that's what I'd say. I mean, I, I'm not an expert on North Carolina. I come here periodically. But my sense is that uh, the force for change is ineluctable. It's irresistible. It's not going to stop. And there are people trying to stop it in the legislature. And some of them have gotten more realistic that they can't hold out forever. Right. Aggressively. I think, I think this is, there is no issue in America today other than the training you're getting for your career that will more affect your life than the fight to fix our democracy. It will affect all the issues that you could care about. Climate change, housing, jobs, uh, immigration reform, criminal justice reform, anything you want to think about is deadlocked politically in this country now, basically because the political system doesn't work right. The voice of the people is not getting through and affecting who gets into office. So in terms of your lives, there is no issue that's more important than political reform. And that's not just North Carolina. This is nationwide. Well, I can tell you, as a guy who started in print, I've had, to re, I've had to reinvent, as a guy who started in print, I've had to reinvent myself two or three times. Um, I first uh, you know, appeared on a lot of talk shows in television, and then I decided to go into television journalism. So I had to learn how to make documentaries, which is more like writing books than it is like reporting for the New York Times. Uh, it, it, the kind of architecture that you have to have for a documentary is similar to the kind of architecture you have to have for a book. Uh, and then I got reasonably good at that, and along comes the internet. I, uh, I now, I'm a guy who's 85 years old. I got three Facebook channels, three Facebook pages. I've got a YouTube channel. I've got a website. I've had to learn totally new stuff, and I'm still not terribly good at it, but I'm in the game. And I think the technology is going to keep changing, and the people who are going to do well have got to be, first of all, good communicators, good storytellers, but then they've got to move with the technology. There is no safety in any particular medium. Uh, the skills are constantly going to have to be relearned. But the most important skill of all is simply being able to tell stories well, to go into a situation, to see what the salient elements are, and to tell them clearly, concisely, and fairly. Well, I can tell you, I, can tell you, uh, um, I wrote a book about Washington some, some years ago called The Power Game, How Washington Works. Uh, and I got teamed up with a former CBS Reports producer named uh, it doesn't matter what his name is. I get teamed up with a former CBS producer uh, who wanted to turn that into a documentary series. And we figured out what chapters would work and so forth. And then I went around and I interviewed some of the same people that I had talked to for the book. Mm -hmm. And when I did the book interviews, I took a tape recorder along, OK? And I got certain quotes. When I went to interview them on camera, and tried to get those same quotes, they wouldn't do it because the camera was there. And I literally had to open the book and read them the quotes they'd given me on the record to get them to talk. So the first thing I learned was getting uh, particularly people who are in a squirmy, uncomfortable position to be candid on camera. And what I learned was I had to learn how to ask questions in a way which made them say more. 
If you're a print reporter, you can, in your question, assume lots of things and get a nod of the head, a quick yes, and an answer that tells you the information you need. If you do it on television, you have to set the question up so that you've effectively got your source pinned in, and then your question has to be very short. So their answer is what you get. And sometimes their answer is a dot. Sometimes it's silence. Sometimes it's a long pause. Uh, television can be very pregnant in what it says even when somebody's not talking. I mean, I've had people in interviews get up and walk out. That was an answer. And I had to learn that I could actually run that on television. As a print reporter, it was non-answer. As a television reporter, it was an answer. So I had to learn how to operate in a completely different medium. So, I mean, I had, to, I had to learn the advantages of television, and I had to learn the shortcomings of television. And I had to change my interview style. I certainly had to change my writing style. I had to learn how to write two pictures and out of pictures, um, uh, into video and out of video, which is something I didn't have to worry about when I was um, doing print. Um, in print, you can take somebody early in a story, and then you can pick them up much later in the story. You don't have to go back and re-identify them. In television, you've got to have a continuity. You've got to have a unity. You wind up by using fewer sources because the viewer can only handle so many personalities. In print, you can do a lot, a lot more. So it's a very, diff it's a very different way of operating. Uh, it's a very different kind of reporting, and it's a different kind of storytelling but it can be enormously powerful. I mean, there are things I can do on television that, that I just can't replicate in print. I cannot generate the, either the tension, the emotion, the conflict, the clarity uh, that you can get when you're confronting somebody. And I'm particularly talking about investigative reporting, the kind of reporting you do for Frontline or something like that. I mean, I've investigated Wall Street, investigated Walmart, investigated the 9-11 pilots, that kind of stuff. You really need to be able to bore in. And with television, you can do it. But you've got to be, in many ways, more skilled than in print. I mean, I, I, think, the, I think the calamity of American democracy today is an urgent problem. This is not just... Um, Politics as usual, um, an in party and an out party. There are, there are norms in American democracy that are being challenged. To have, have a president say that the, the media is the enemy of the people, that's a phrase that Stalin, the Soviet dictator, used against enemies of the state, and they were sent to prison and often shot, sent to uh, Siberia. That's a, that's a very powerful phrase. I mean, that's devastating to have somebody uh, target. Uh, CNN, target the New York Times, target people specifically. Um, it's one thing to say, look, they ran a story, and I don't agree with it. They got it wrong and take issue with it. That's standard. Uh, we expect that in a democracy. Uh, but to broadly, uh, with a sweeping charge, say this is fake news. Fake news, let's be clear about it. Fake news is artificially generated supposed information. It is simulated. It's not real. That's very different from news that you disagree with. Right. Even false news is different. It's news and you're taking issue with it. When the president says it's fake news, he means it's made up. That's baloney. Mm -hmm. That's not true. Uh, it's not true in terms of uh, almost everybody he charges with that. So that's a serious problem. Uh, he's now challenged the Congress on its authority uh, to vote money. Uh, he asked the Congress for money for the wall. Congress said, no, we're not going to give you what you want. We're going to give you this amount of money. And now he's saying, first president, saying, I'm going to take the money even though you didn't give it to me. Well, the Constitution is pretty clear. The power of the purse lies with the Congress, Article I of the Constitution. So you've got a, you've got a leadership here uh, that challenges the loyalty and trustworthiness of judges. Because a, a judge has a Hispanic background, he says he can't trust the ruling. He's casting questions about all kinds of institutions in our democracy. Um, but way before Trump, this problem comes way before Trump. We've had gerrymandered elections. Ever since the Citizens United decision, we've had unlimited corporate money. We have dark money in politics uh, to a level that we've never experienced before. The independent expenditures after the, the, the Citizens United decision went from $8 million in one year to $300 million the next year to $1.4 billion in the election cycle after that. 
I mean, it's unbelievable the degree to which our democracy is being corrupted by money, by gerrymandering, and by suppression of vote. Those are really fundamental problems about whether or not our democracy can work effectively. So yeah, this is urgent. Is it more urgent since 2016? Yes, but the problem really predates it. It's a big mistake for people to think Trump created the problem. Trump is a tumor, but he's not the cancer. We've got to cure the cancers, and the cancers are deep in our political system. We have to root them out. And the great thing is, and the story I'm really excited to tell, is people are doing that. They're fighting for it in North Carolina. They did it in Utah and Colorado and Michigan and Ohio and Missouri uh, and Florida and Maine and Connecticut and half a dozen other states last year. This year, there's already reform in New York, in Hawaii. You've got bills in the legislature for gerrymander reform in North Carolina. Uh, in Louisiana, they just returned the vote to, to uh, felons who had served their time. There's reform going on at the grassroots in the states all over this country. And the media is not covering that story. That's a big problem. Absolutely. I, I think it's people need to understand how Donald Trump got power. He was part of a rebellion from the bottom up. If you look at the 2016 election, it was a very different election from typical American elections. Most American elections are left, right, conservative, liberal, Democrat, Republican. This was an election of rebellion from below in both parties. Bernie Sanders in the Democratic Party represented a revolt from below against Hillary Clinton, who was an establishment candidate. He was the voice of the people who were left behind. He was the voice of the people who have been hurt by economic inequality. And in the Republican Party, Donald Trump ran against 15 establishment candidates, governors, senators, people who had been in office for a long time. And he resonated with particularly people in rural America, but lots of, of working class white males who felt their jobs were in jeopardy, they had no economic future, and they couldn't deliver anything for their kids. So he was talking again for forgotten Americans. Now what he's done since then and whether or not he lived up to that is another question, but he did touch that and, and those people trust him. I mean, people talk about the loyalty of the Trump base. Part of it is that they don't trust the establishment and the establishment media is part of the establishment. So they take his word against often establishment media, CNN, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, what have you, uh, because they've come to mistrust the system. They don't believe the system is reaching out to them, taking care of them, and giving them a chance. And they see Trump as their champion. Not soon. No, I don't think so. Russia has periods in its history, going back three or four centuries, uh, where it has 10 or 15 years or 20 years of, of uh, progressivism, of opening up. Uh, there was a group called the Decembers back in the early 19th century after Nicholas I, who was a Stalinist type czar. Uh, and then in the late 19th century, they had another burst. And then uh, they had another burst in the beginning of the 20th century. And then Gorbachev's period uh, of perestroika and so forth. So it's not unusual in Russian history that they have these periods, but they tend to bow go backwards after a while, they clamp down. Russians are, are um, they're very suspicious of, of what freedom lets loose. They like order, they've seen disorder uh, and terrible violence, terrible losses of millions of people uh, in their society, both under czars and certainly under Stalin and under communists. Um, and they like what they call a krepki kulap, they like a strong hand at the top uh, and so uh, they're intellectuals, they're middle class people, they're people who work in the universities. Uh, they're all in favor of democracy, of opening up, of a free press, of the ability to travel abroad, uh, of printing all kinds of books and literature and so forth. But the narod, the people, the folk, uh, they're, they worry about that. They worry about what gets let loose, the troubles that occur. Uh, and they have a they have a phrase they keep repeating uh, in Russian history, the time of troubles. You do this and you get a time of troubles. So a leader like Putin can play on that fear and does very effectively. Dictators play on the fear, fears of people. Democracies try to awaken the hopes of people. So you've got hope versus fear. And in Russian history, fear is a more powerful motivator than hope. In American history, hope has been a more powerful motivator than fear. But Fear is being used right now 
by Donald Trump and by people around him and by people on the right to try to suppress uh, free activity, free action, reform, uh, more opportunity for disadvantaged people, for minorities and for people who grow up in poor circumstances. Well, let me be clear. Uh, my, my role is not to promote grassroots democracy. My role is to report on grassroots democracy. I mean, I think that if more people know what's happening around the country, they'll be motivated to do something in their own state. What they do is up to them. Uh, but, but I think the evidence is that, that people are frustrated, angry, disenchanted. Look at the polls, uh, poll after poll, and this goes back now about 15 years, 70 to 80 percent of the people will say, Corporations have too much power. Lobbies have too much power. Special interests have taken over Washington. Politicians and people in office don't, think, don't listen to people like me. Uh, the system's unfair. Elections are rigged. I saw one poll, it's 90% said the democracy, our democracy is broken. So the feeling out there that something is really fundamentally wrong, not just a miss, not just a flaw here and there, but something's really wrong and it's not working the way the founders intended and it's not the way we want, is very widespread. And what I see now that's different in the last four or five years in particular is that people have now moved from anger to action. That in more and more places around the country, uh, people are saying, we can't wait for Washington to fix it. We can't wait for the politicians to fix it. In Michigan, last year, there was a 29-year-old graduate student named Katie Fabe, and she was upset about the gerrymandering of congressional seats uh, in the state of Michigan. She put on a Facebook post. Within a week, she had 5,000 responses. She started a movement. They got 400,000 signatures to put on the ballot in Michigan a measure to roll back gerrymandering and to force an independent commission to do it instead of letting the politicians do it. That's the kind of thing that's happening in one state after another. It happened in Missouri. It happened in Montana. Uh, it happened in Colorado. I mean, when you see that happening, jumping around the country, you know something. Some spark has been lit. It's a great story. It's an important story. And I'm a journalist who likes to tell stories, as you said, from the bottom up. And just in conclusion, why do you think it's important to focus on telling this story to colleges and college students? It's your future. You have more stake in fixing our democracy than I do. I'm in my 80s. You're in your 20s. Um, you've got to live with what we've got here for a long time. It's going to affect your lives. Whether or not we have a, a functioning democracy that is fair, that actually reflects the votes of the people, and the voices of the people is absolutely critical to you all. And it's critical to the kind of economic development we have. It's critical to whether or not uh, we can control uh, climate change and save the planet. Uh, it's critical to how we handle people who want to come into our borders, how we tr retrain workers. There are workers being thrown out of, out of work all the time because of global competition. What do you do? Leave them on the ash heap at 45 or at 50 or at 55? Or do you have a system that retrains them and helps companies get back on their feet after they've been knocked on by, by, uh, by global competition? So I think these stories are enormously important for everybody, but particularly for the younger generation to understand, to, to make the connections uh, between uh, their lives and the politics of today. Yesterday, I was at a state uh, university, and I asked how many students had student debt problems, and practically every hand went up in the room, right? And then I said, how many of you know that the state legislature votes appropriations that affect how much money your college gets if your college gets more money, you pay less tuition. If it gets less money, you pay more tuition. How many of you can identify that your problem of student debt can be affected by your vote in state elections? Those are the kinds of connections, it seems to me, um, younger people have to start making. Um, and we, as older people, need to be talking to you about issues that matter to you, not just issues that matter to us.